Okay, we are online now. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AI Society program, uh, an interdisciplinary dialogue on challenges ahead for AI and society. I'm Andre Pin, I'm a member of a group. Uh, I'm organizing, I'm co organizing and chairing this session today. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome you uh, through Zoom and, and on YouTube. Uh, if you are participating in the YouTube, in the Zoom session, feel free to uh, write uh, in a chat and send a que send, send out questions. And after the presentation, we'll be happy to have a dialogue with our distinguished speakers today. Um, let me just briefly introduce you uh, our speakers, and then I'll give the floor to them. Our first speaker will be Chiara Gallese from Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, our topic will be about profiling and automated decision making through AI based software, a threat for vulnerable groups. Uh, it's very interesting to start a, a talk with the other threat. Um, Beatrice Panattoni uh, from the University of Verona uh, will talk about artificial intelligence, the challenges for criminal law in facing the passage from technological automation to artificial autonomy. And the third and main speaker for today, senior colleague, is uh, Professor Woodrow Hartzog from Northeastern University, uh, from across the pond, let's say. And he will be speaking about a very hot topic uh, these, these days, especially in the US, but not just in the US, uh, which is the case, well, he, he will make the case against facial recognition uh, technologies. Um, I'll, with no further ado, I'll give the floor to Chiara Gallese, who will be introducing us to the threats of AI for vulnerable groups. Thank you, Chiara, for being with us. The floor is yours. I will just keep, take the liberty of reminding you when time is about to end for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sharing my screen right now. Please let me know if you see it. it. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Today I will talk about uh, profiling and automated decision making through AI based software, in particular, uh, a threat for the vulnerable group problem. I am from Eindhoven University of Technology and Carlo Cattano University, Luke. So I will first uh, show what we do we mean with uh, uh, automated decision making. I will draw some consideration about the uh, principles of GDPR related to this topic. I will then talk about the Siri case in the Netherlands. I will show some further example of problematic ADM. I will uh, try to explain why ADM could be so harmful, especially for vulnerable group, and I will then draw some conclusions. So for automated decision making, especially with AI software, we mean uh, collecting data from data subject, analyzing them automatically with uh, some uh, software, especially uh, with the AI technology, and then taking a decision that have an impact on the data subject. Uh, this uh, system are very uh, widespread, they are very used, uh, especially in the present time where the machine learning technique are so common. This uh, process has been uh, also defined as automated inequality and um, special rapporteur on extreme poverty um, of the um, uh, United Nations, Prof. Uh, Philip Alston, also talked about this um, system of automatically predict, identify, survey, detect, target, and punish the data subject, the citizens that are more vulnerable. And this could uh, reflect some values and assumptions that are very far and sometimes even antithetical to the principles of human rights especially when uh, the most vulnerable people are involved. The uh, GDPR draws some basic concepts and principles to be applied to the automated decision making. First, the most important is that to uh, uh, use these systems, there must be a legal basis. 
that could be, for example, uh, a law establishing these systems uh, or a consent or the performance of a contract. Another important principle is transparency. So uh, the data subject must be informed about uh, how the uh, decision will be made. And this means that um, it's not uh, compliant to use a black box model because it's not possible to understand how the system came to the decision. And then there are the um, principle of purpose limitation and data minimization. So the subject must be informed on how the, their data will be used for what purpose um, and all the data that are uh, collected from the data subject should be only those necessary to uh, reach the purpose that has been shown to the data subject. And of course, the data subject must be granted some uh, fundamental rights that are drawn in the GDPR, such as the right to object to the um, automated decision-making in the case of uh, the consent and the contract. The city case is, uh, that happened in the Netherlands recently is very interesting, not only because it caused the uh, government to resign, even if only two months before the end of the mandate, but also because it was a, a very big scandal that uh, highlighted how easily a vulnerable group can be um, hit uh, by these uh, systems. Uh, this algorithm was based on a black box model uh, and was applied to decide over the childcare allowance and to detect, detect the frauds related to the tax. So it was used by uh, many public agencies in the Netherlands, including municipalities. Um, they use uh, pseudo anonymized data, so data that was not anonymous. Uh, the legal basis for this system to be introduced in the Netherlands was uh, a law. The law establishing uh, the uh, city system, previously SUVI system, and a law uh, allowing uh, for public interest purposes uh, the um, using of this um, automated decision-making system. That was the GDPR Implementation Act. The problem with this system, it was not only that uh, the model was a black box, so not uh, transparent and explicable, but also that it was utilized uh, mostly only toward poorer neighborhoods that were, were populated by immigrants and ethnic minorities. And in that case, it exacerbated the already present uh, societal disparities. The process of uh, detecting uh, the tax-related frauds was treated as a mass process, automatically um, detecting the frauds, uh, with an approach that was everything or nothing, and a principle that was uh, related to intent, intentional uh, conduct, or gross culpability. Therefore, uh, the algorithm treated every mistake as a fraud. So even the fact that uh, the data subject uh, forgot or lost some receipt regarding the expenses of the childcare, uh, it um, branded those parents, those family as uh, intentional fraudster. So the childcare allowance was unfairly discontinued um, and it was not possible to arrange a payment, a delay in the payment. And as a result, these families faced severe financial difficulties. And why I am saying this? Because uh, maybe I have to explain that in the Netherlands, the Dutch, the, the Dutch system is very expensive, not only the cost of living, but the childcare itself is extremely uh, expensive. So it could reach even more than 2000 euros uh, per month. So 
uh, those families that were in financial um, difficulties because they were in fact asking for the childcare allowance had to um, return uh, 10,000 euros per family per person in the face of a very small mistake. And uh, uh, more than 90,000 people were affected by this system. So the, co the, the case was brought to the um, uh, court of The Hague by some uh, civil rights organizations. And the court ruled out that the system was contrary to the um, uh, Human Rights Convention uh, because it violates uh, the right of the protection of uh, personal data. And it did not have enough um, protection for the data subject. So the, the court relied on the fairness and transparency uh, principle and uh, the principle of respect of private life. The, the district court of The Hague held that the, this system, this algorithm was violating Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, why the court did not take into consideration the Dutch constitution? Uh, that's because uh, the judges uh, in the Netherlands are not allowed to um, decide over the uh, infringement of constitutional rights. And so they had to appeal to the Convention of Human Rights. So the judge held that the legislation was um, not uh, giving enough uh, information to the data su subject. It was insufficiently clear and verifiable. So uh, it de uh, declared that the law itself was uh, incompatible with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the transparency principle was not observed. In fact, um, the system itself led to a discrimination and stigmatization of the citizens that were most vulnerable and also uh, took into consideration the principle of GDPR and uh, it held that uh, that system was in contrast with the right to respect for private life. And also the data subject did not have enough information to change that behavior accordingly to the system to avoid the fines. So the safeguards that are required by the GDPR when implementing a law that allows the automated decision-making system were insufficient. So how widespread is ADM actually in the world? Well, it is quite used. So almost every country, almost every public administration in the government are using this system. So it's quite even more uh, spread that we might uh, think. And I argue that the consent is enough to protect a vulnerable group because they are in fact powerless in front of states, public administration, governments, and also uh, more powerful uh, parties. Um, in fact, uh, those systems are used for recruiting, for uh, granting the mortgage, for um, deciding who will get the health insurance. There were many cases, many famous cases uh, regarding this that were detrimental to vulnerable groups. For example, the very famous Compass case uh, where uh, the automated decision-making system was used to uh, predict the reiteration risk of uh, uh, criminals convicted. So in conclusion, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, um, it, there is a need of an explicable uh, uh, systems uh, so the uh, ADM should not be based on a black box model because the data used uh, to uh, implement those algorithms and to train the neural network could be biased and could reflect the um, societal disparities. 
but also i argue that vulnerable groups such as uh, poor people um, people that are um, not healthy like patients in hospital for example uh, people that are asking for allowance all those uh, vulnerable groups should not be subject to the automated decision making First, because we have seen that even a state law is not enough to protect them, but also because even if they give their consent, sometimes their counterpart is much powerful and they don't even have the power to uh, argue with them, to, to object to this system. They don't even have enough uh, knowledge to understand the actual consequences of this system. And also, I argue that even in the case where there is a stata law, the human supervision should always be present. Because as the Siri cause uh, demonstrates, uh, it's very easy to draw a system that is not fair, is unbalanced, and it's uh, difficult for the data subject. So thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chiara, uh, for for many reasons, among which is the fact that you just uh, kept up with the timing, uh, which was not easy, but the topic was very interesting. And actually, it hit news some days ago throughout Europe, at least, I think. So it was very timely and, and well-presented topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll, I'll give the floor and look forward to for the discussion about that. Uh, I give the floor now to Beatrice Panattoni, who's going to speak about the challenges for criminal law in facing the passage from technology and to automation to artificial autonomy. The floor is yours, Beatrice. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want, uh, first of all, to thank the organizers for having me. It is a, a great ple pleasure and privilege being able to share with you the most recent developments of my doctoral research. Uh, the topic of my presentation concerns, uh, as uh, said by Professor Pin already, uh, the challenges that criminal law will soon have to face when it comes to harms uh, connected to the functioning of artificial intelligence applications. In this talk, I'm going first uh, to describe a possible categorization of crimes involving AI, and afterwards, I will analyze which options a society has to address the issue of responsibility allocation related to these new kind of crimes. The peculiar features that characterize AI systems allow them, unlike other technologies, to have a stronger active contribution in the interaction processes with the users. Therefore, AI applications create new forms of interactions that raise new challenges for the law. One of them concerns uh, the emergence of AI systems functioning. Emergence is a stated goal of robotics and artificial intelligence, and it can be understood as a different way of referring to the autonomy that characterizes AI systems. This capacity can lead the system to elaborate solutions to the goal assigned to it that the operator wouldn't have thought about. Therefore, we can say, using uh, the words of Professor Ryan Kahlo, that AI systems are built to be uh, unpredictable by design. With this feature, much is gained in terms of efficiency. However, unexpected problem solving by artificial agents presents uh, new questions for the law. One of the main consequences uh, of the emergence of AI is that it challenges responsibility models based on the human agent's control role, creating what has been defined uh, as a control dilemma. This new scenario is actually the evolution of a process started already with information and communication technologies. Indeed, in the own life world, artifacts have ceased to be uh, mere machines simply operating according to human instructions, and they now can escape human control. With regard to uh, criminal law, uh, since uh, AI applications have already and will make it possible to realize new activities and to reach new goals, it is likely that new ways of realizing existing uh, criminal offenses will begin to occur, and that also new forms of crimes will ask for the intervention of the legislator in criminalizing them. 
Thomas King, Wu Pagallo, and other scholars have started to suggest that we will need to think about a specific group of crimes that we may call AI crimes. In order to try to organize the subject, we can suggest dividing these new future crimes into three different groups. The first group is cases where the AI system is used by a criminal agent as the means to realize the crime. Think about what is already known as a deep fish AI, an algorithm that learns to create better phishing attacks and it is, it is able to bypass spam filter systems or the new threats related to deep fakes that could lead to uh, new forms of fraud, political manipulation, revenge pornography, or extortion. The second group of crimes is uh, cases where the AI system is the object against which is committed the crime. With the spread of AI applications in every sector of our daily life, criminal behavior against such systems aimed at affecting, damaging, or manipulating their functioning will become increasingly frequent and dangerous. Researchers in the field of AI have in fact shown that it is possible by polluting the system datasets to trick artificial agents. For instance, uh, by placing stickers on a traffic signal, it is possible to make a self-driving car ignore a speed limit. It will then be necessary to verify whether and to what extent existing cyber crimes are applicable to these cases and which gaps in the legislation should be filled. The third group of crimes is cases where the realization of a crime is caused by the emergent behavior of an AI system. We have already some examples. Uh, think about the case of the random darknet shopper, um, a bot set up to make random purchases of the deep web for an art exhibition in Switzerland that started buying illegal drugs. The first two groups of crimes present the lesser issues. In the majority of these cases, we will indeed have a human agent acting with criminal intent that will have to be identified and held criminally responsible for the harm caused. That is not to say, of course, that these cases will come with no challenges. For instance, we could ask ourselves uh, what happens if the AI system changes its course of action and realize or contribute to realize a different crime than the one wanted by the human agent behind its programming. However, it is the last group of crimes that present the hardest issues. In front of AI system with a high level of autonomy, the criminal responsibility model that is expected to be the most relevant in such cases is that of the operator's negligent failure to prevent an unlawful outcome that he had a legal obligation to avert. Result elaborated and executed by the artificial agent during its usual application or use. Here, uh, the challenging effects of AI systems emerge more clearly. Uh, the possibility to punish the human operator in compliance with the principle of culpability, one of the cornerstones of criminal justice systems, is indeed challenged by the unpredictability or better emergence that could characterize the behavior of the AI system that caused the harm. Therefore, in these cases, as outlined already by uh, Andreas Matthias and also most recently by the Working Group on AI and Criminal Law of the Council of Europe, a responsibility gap might follow. The artificial agent cannot be held directly responsible according to the principles of criminal law. We can outline two different arguments in favor of this statement. A philosophical argument, AI systems cannot be qualified as free moral agents able to choose whether to act against the law or not, so they cannot be considered guilty for the harm connected to their emergent behaviors. And we have also a pragmatic argument that is uh, AI feels no punishment. So it does not seem possible to attribute individual criminal responsibility to these entities. On the other hand, the human agent who has no sufficient control over the system's autonomous functioning cannot be criminally reprobable for not exercising the duty to act required to him. So it, remain to, it remains to establish who is to be held criminally responsible in this last group of crimes. Given that uh, this field of investigation is in its early stages, for now we can only try to draft three possible scenarios that the responsibility gap might open. 
The first one is limiting AI autonomy. We can decide to adopt a scientific skeptical approach that uses the principle of precaution, either as a directive of legislative policy or as, as, as the basis on which elaborate models of responsibility with the inevitable result of limiting AI systems autonomy. Faced with the uncertainty that uh, could characterize the outputs of AI used in application capable of arming fundamental human rights, the legislator could choose to limit the tasks that can be assigned to an AI system or the autonomy that can characterize its, fun its functioning. However, this scenario presents uh, uh, some limits. Such choices could eventually translate into prohibitions on the use of certain artificial agents, an approach that could be very limiting given the potential of the development and use of AI technologies. Even though it seems preferable for legislators to avoid assuming a general precautionary approach in their AI policies, at the same time, a moderate conceptualization of precautionary principle might be useful, especially in a phase of uh, creation and development of AI applications that are used to perform tasks that can easily lead to consequences, even irreversible, of serious injuries. A virtuous example that could be qualified as a temporary and provisional alternative to a grave ban on the production and use of AI systems in certain contexts is the one adopted in Japan. In the past years, in fact, the Japanese government has created special, special areas dedicated to the experimentation and development of robotic agents, real living lab uh, or topu in which technicians and population can verify that the robot performs the task assigned to it safely, as well as determine what legal disputes may arise in this area. Therefore, even though uh, certain limits uh, to uh, technological autonomy will have to be established, as we already saw uh, with Article 22 of the GDPR, for example, at the same time, the path of limiting the autonomy of AI systems cannot be a general approach in regulating arms that artificial agents functioning can cause. The second scenario might be lowering men's rare in crime. We could set in relevant normative frameworks, such as product liability law, strict standards to which human operators have to comply and that are able to establish the level of duty of care expected to them, over which they cannot be held criminally responsible in case of harmful outcomes. According to this perspective, operators that comply with these strict standards have fulfilled their duty of care, and even if they remain aware, together with all society, of the permanence of certain risks. So according to this approach, in cases of arms connected to the emergent behavior of AI, since mens rea is missing, we will, not, we will have no perpetrator and no crime at all. This proposal is based on the future prospect that the use of AI applications will become increasingly widespread and generalized, leading the legislator to consider the risk that may arise from their use as a risk objectively and subjectively tolerated, accepted in virtue of the great benefits that such technologies bring to society itself. Nevertheless, this hypothesis presents two limits. On one hand, the qualification of the risk, as a, a, the risk as accepted by society due to the benefits brought by the implementation of AI systems can only be articulated by single sector, but it may lead to different consideration according to each AI application and its level of risk. On the other hand, resorting only to remedies of an administrative or civil nature may present some limits because it may not be sufficient to guarantee effective results in terms of deterrence and prevention. The third and last scenario is beginning to elaborate a new legal framework for AI-related crimes. In this last scenario, the first question will be, to, uh, will, will be whether to use uh, human crimes of negligence or crimes involving corporate liability. Resorting to human crimes of negligence seems particularly arguable because it presents two problems. The first concerns, as mentioned before, the principle of culpability. The realization of the crime in these cases is contaminated by the autonomous functioning of the AI system, and therefore the set of preventive measures that the operator has to implement ex ante are very distant from the realization of the harm, which, as we said before, cannot always be foreseeable. 
This will inevitably lead to forms of uh, strict liability in criminal law that is not constitutionally legitimate in all legal systems and cannot be therefore an answer to our question. The second problem is the reality of networks that stay, is, they stay behind the uh, AI systems, the problem of many hands. Another transformation brought already by the information communication technology technologies and outlined by uh, Luciano Floridi is the shift from the uh, primacy of standalone things, properties and binary relations to the primacy of interactions, processes and networks. AI technologies amplify this process. In fact, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to trace back a harmful output of the artificial agent to a single human agent. It is also called the problem of irreducibility by Ryan Abbott and Alex Sarch. These two elements could be uh, the cause, but also the solution to the problem. They indeed suggest that forms of uh, distributed legal responsibility elaborated on a risk-based approach that keeps uh, the principle of accountability on its core may represent the most suitable option in the context of AI. As new manifestations of our risk society, AI applications have to deal with the regulatory logic of anticipation of legal protection that characterizes activities with significant levels of risk. For those AI applications, for instance, robotics, that present a high risk for the protection of human rights and that for harms they cause, criminal law likely needs to be involved, uh, this possible form of corporate liability could be structured on legal obligations mainly involving the design phase of these artifacts, establishing a new level of, ne of negligence. Legal obligations to which private actors that create, actualize, and manage the risk related to AI applications have to comply so that their activity is informed not only by on the principle of virtuous self-organization, but also on a new general duty shaped by the principle of legal protection by design. The principal aim of this perspective and here I feel that I'm aligned to the conclusion of Chiara, is not to identify uh, some form of control over AI systems based on which, uh, if not exercised correctly, it is possible to hold liable the, the corporation, but to shift our focus on forms of accountability that could then lead to premium liability, formulated on the legal design of the decision-making process that we decide to delegate completely or partially to an artificial agent agent in order to make it explainable and contestable and also built on the necessary interaction between AI systems and operators or users involved in the different phases of the life cycle of the artificial agent. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much Beatricia. Uh, very, very thoughtful and interesting presentation. I look forward to, to get deeper into this, uh, this, this area later. I don't see any uh, questions for clarification. Let me remind people that they can feel free to send uh, sort of questions through our chat box or even wave their hands and we'll try to give floor for them to speak uh, during our Q&A uh, uh, time. Now I give the floor to Professor Woodrow Artsok, who's going to take us through a tour de force on or one of the most debated and uh, controversial uh, technologies uh, in the US, right? Um, artificial recognition. Uh, floor is yours, Woodrow. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Professor Finn. And, and thank you to everyone at the AI uh, Society program at the University of Padua. And also uh, thank you to my co-panelists for such excellent uh, presentations. And I look forward to the Q&A period um, to get into your topics more, because I think that, uh, that you're really onto something very interesting. Um, so my talk today is called The Case Against Spatial Recognition. And this is part of an ongoing research project uh, that I have in collaboration with Evan Selinger, who is a philosophy professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And together we've written a number of articles. And this is, uh, this is some of our latest work. Okay, so let me start by saying most of you are probably familiar with some of the touted benefits of facial recognition technology, the technology that uh, is powered by 
uh, artificial intelligence using people's face prints to recognize uh, faces and certain aspects of uh, characterizing faces. So uh, many of the, the perspectives have been widely touted. Um, and uh, you might be tempted to think that we should definitely embrace this technology because of all the good that can come from it. So from this perspective of uh, facial recognition technology, you'll never have to meet a stranger or fuss with passwords or you worry about forgetting your wallet. Um, you will be able to organize your entire video and picture collection in seconds, um, even instantly find photos of your kids running around at summer camp. More important, missing people will be located, schools will become safe, and the bad guys won't get away uh, by hiding in the shadows. Total convenience, absolute justice, churches completely full on Sundays. At long last, our tech utopia will be realized. I am here to tell you today, my friends, that it's not going to work. And even if it did, the costs would be far too high and embracing this technology wouldn't be worth it. Uh, I'd like to make three points today. One, facial recognition is the perfect tool for oppression. The world has never seen anything like it. Uh, two, the standard procedural rules and use limitations that we usually deploy for information technologies will not ultimately stall the surveillance creep and inevitable abuse of these technologies. Um, what Evan and I have argued in our research is that what is needed are stigmas, moratoriums, and outright bans on this uniquely dangerous surveillance technology. All right, so first, this is the most dangerous surveillance tool ever built. What do I mean by that? Well, first, of course, when many people conjure up the harms of facial recognition, one of the first things they think of is the uh, uh, oppressive chill uh, that, that comes from surveillance, from constantly being watched. Um, and of course, this is one of these significant things that we should be concerned about because facial recognition, when widely displayed, when widely deployed would allow for widespread um, surveillance because your faces act as a beacon. They follow you everywhere you go and can be targeted at a distance. Um, and so certainly the chilling effects that we generally try to avoid, the ways in which people change their behavior, they self-censor, they uh, refrain from engaging in all sorts of conduct that they might be beneficial, that they might otherwise engage in, would be limited or wouldn't exist at all. Um, and so that's, of course, a major piece of this story, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. One of the reasons that uh, uh, Evan and I have argued uh, against facial recognition technologies is, is because um, one of the things that it threatens most uh, uh, acutely is the concept of privacy as obscurity. And we've written about this in some of our other research. But the idea is that when information is hard um, or unlikely to be found or understood, then we all intuitively understand that it is to a relative degree safe. Many of us, when we go about our day-to-day -day lives, walk around not wondering, well, is someone following us literally every place we go able to track our movements? Um, many of you may have, um, gossips in a restaurant because the likelihood of the person that that you're gossiping about hearing you is is minuscule even though you were in public even though you were you know shopping for perhaps sensitive uh drugs at the at the drugstore um we live our lives in zones of obscurity and it's and evan and i have argued that this is one of the most valuable most underappreciated ways of thinking about privacy that all of us need in order to flourish as human beings. And the problem is that facial recognition is an obscurity eviscerating machine. Imagine that every single person that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life um, will know everything that's on the first page of the Google search results when you, when you Google your name. Um, you're able to be instantly recognized uh, and then they're able to, because they recognize you, instantly pull up a profile um, perhaps if uh, technology companies get their way and implement facial recognition technology within the glasses that they're now marketing uh, with uh, augmented reality capabilities, then they'll be able to pull up a full profile 
on everything they can find about you with a quick search on the internet. Um, even photos that you might not have even known existed on the internet because of course, up till this point, they weren't searchable by your name. If this sort of future is realized and we lose that obscurity, there would be nowhere you could go, no doctor you could visit, no restaurant you could eat in without being known by every single person that you encounter. Um, this has, I would have, I think, incredibly negative social effects for all of us, given the ways in which we utilize obscurity to create zones of safety um, it, for us to safely interact, right? within communities. Um, this also would have a significant implication upon a test that's deployed widely in the United States called the reasonable expectations of privacy test. Um, and there's a lot of, of litigation over whether someone has a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in their public movements. And right now, the answer is potentially maybe, but facial recognition, um, if widely deployed, would essentially eviscerate any expectation because of course, we could be and would be likely tracked every single place that we went. But of course, the harm from facial recognition technologies isn't solely because of the surveillance harms. One of the reasons that facial recognition technology is so dangerous is, is it because it enables lots of different other harms. It is a utility that can be added on to existing technologies to exacerbate lots of inequities and facilitate lots of different abuses. Here's what I mean by that. One of the things that has become abundantly clear in the past couple of years, thanks to really important re uh, 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 research that's come out from scholars like Joy Bulamwini and Timnit Gebru about uh, the incredible bias nature of facial recognition technologies. Um, we, we can demonstrably show that the uh, uh, AI that powers facial recognition technologies are biased uh, against marginalized and vulnerable populations like people of color um, for several different reasons. Part of it is because of the data set that is used, the, it's, it's biased data that is used to train the, uh, the AI, but also because there is a lack of representation within the groups that build these technologies. And so all of that means that facial recognition technologies is significantly less accurate and therefore more harmful for vulnerable and marginalized populations. Um, the next point, which I, which I thought uh, Kiara also did a really great job talking about um, in her presentation was the fact that it's not just that these technologies are dangerous because they are inaccurate and they are biased, but rather because facial recognition is a tool of control. We know that marginalized and vulnerable populations will feel the brunt of these technologies first and hardest. And so it, it by design almost, and inevitably will lead to inequitable um, outcomes. So many people will not feel the negative effects of facial recognition technology immediately. But we know from uh, all evidence, essentially throughout history, then marginalized and vulnerable populations will feel them first and hardest. So there also is this notion that um, when information is easy to collect, that we should be doing it, right? Because what happens is, is if we start to deploy facial recognition broadly, there's going to be a societal push to implement it in more and more places. So if something goes wrong that theoretically could have been um, prevented with the use of facial recognition, then people will start to say, well, why didn't you deploy facial recognition here? Um, and one of the worries that Evan and I have is that if facial recognition is deployed widely to watch everyone all the time, then we will start to see a slow shift in some default presumptions that we have um, about uh, people in society. We're shifting from a, a notion that we all are presumed innocent until there's some reason to think that we did something wrong, moving towards a state where there is a system put in place to ensure that it treats us all as though we're all about on the verge of, of, of committing some sort of wrongful act. Um, 
And, uh, and that's just because it's the natural sort of way in which surveillance systems work is that when, once they're created, um, there are all these forces that say, well, why don't we deploy them more widely? Because they could have stopped X, Y, Z, right? We have a tendency to look back and say, if only we had better surveillance technology, we could have stopped these things. And, and the other problem with that is that once data is created, um, there is a strong desire to keep it. And I think that we've seen this already um, in a lot of the uh, debates over data minimization and data deletion, uh, we've seen government efforts uh, continually arguing, well, we need to keep this data um, for a long time because it could be useful sometime in the future. Um, and facial recognition is almost the ultimate treasure trove of information because it tracks so many different things and it tracks people's uh, whereabouts um, so frequently. Uh, another reason why facial recognition is the most dangerous surveillance tool ever invented um, is the way in which it is most likely to be used not by governments, but by individuals. So we'd like to think that people will use facial recognition technology for useful and good purposes, right? So maybe we imagine having uh, augmented reality glasses that allow us to remember uh, the names of someone that we just met at a party and we say, oh, hi. Uh, you know, I, I see you, Andrea. It's, 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 a, it's been a while since I've seen you and we can use it to um, play funny games and use Snapchat filters that go over our face. Um, but in reality, we know that one of its uh, uh, first uses and, and certainly one of its most harmful will be used for harassment and for stalking. The internet hate machine, we've already seen ways in which it gets turned against people um, and using facial recognition technology uh, people that are fleeing domestic violence will have a significantly harder time concealing their location. People that become subject to um, troll mobs that, that focus all of their hate on anyone that dared speak out against social injustice um, will be targeted everywhere they go in restaurants. This is an example um, where uh, in Russia, someone used a, a group of people used a message board to track exactly where an adult film star was, was walking throughout town. And they would post messages and say, oh, she's in this restaurant right now if you want to target her, right? And so when there's nowhere we can hide, there are often many good reasons why people's physical um, uh, locations uh, are best shrouded in obscurity rather than immediately available to the entire world. Um, and it's precisely because it will enable harassment and stalking harms as we've already seen um, play out. But of course, that's not the only reason why facial recognition is so dangerous. One of the um, uh, 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 sort of under the radar, but perhaps most pernicious ways in which facial recognition poses a threat to people is simply because it will con continue to feed into the surveillance capitalism machine because it is a plug and play technology. It can be layered over all sorts of systems that people use. Um, uh, and it, people are going to now increasingly want to incorporate facial recognition systems into their own systems to quantify people's faces, to quantify their lives in, in more ways. And the result is collectively, we will all be uh, worse off. Um, it, as if we didn't have enough to worry about in our lives, imagine having every interaction within a relationship where we don't have the power. And there are lots of relationships where we lack power. When we are interviewing for a job or when we are getting a performance review from our, uh, from our employer, um, or where we, whether we are uh, trying to obtain some sort of, of benefit that we really need to make a good impression for, imagine every interaction in any of those relationships being subjected to something like affect recognition, which measures how your face reacted to particular uh, questions. This is already being used in interviews, for example, where someone would say, how do you feel about working overtime? And if you furrow your brow at the question, then perhaps the system will say, ah, this person is not a team player, rejected. So now, in addition to having to worry about all of our responses, we have to worry about how our uh, uh, facial tics might uh, disqualify us for particular kinds of jobs or other kinds of benefits. Um, and so I think that this is one of the, the sort of low key, um, but really powerful ways in which uh, facial recognition 
uh, threatens our autonomy and it threatens our overall social well-being. So that's why I think that uh, facial recognition is the most dangerous surveillance technology ever created. Now, there is a school of thought that says that, well, it's true that there are dangers for facial recognition technology, but we have uh, ways in which we can limit the harmful effects of those technologies. We have a series of rules that we can already deploy that will um, prohibit many of these nightmare scenarios from ever coming true. Um, and certainly there are things that you can do that might be relatively helpful. Um, but the, the argument that Evan and I uh, make here is that control and the, the sort of mandatory proceduralist rules and even limits on use will not work for this uniquely dangerous technology. Um, often we deploy things like transparency and we think that transparency will bring accountability. Um, one of the ways in which we justify all sorts of data processing, um, both within the EU, but also uh, uh, in the US is through consent mechanisms. We say, as long as people give their consents, then they should be allowed to uh, use this, this kind of information. They require law enforcement to get warrants, right? Which is uh, making uh, the use of facial recognition difficult, but, uh, but possible. Um, uh, and then they require things like impact assessments and all of these things might be useful for other kinds of AI powered systems. And so one of the points that Evan and I want to make is that, that we're not saying that all AI technologies are writ large bad. In fact, there's remarkable benefits that we think that can come from them. What we are saying is that facial recognition technology is uniquely dangerous. And it is, fact, it is, it is in fact so unique that it is, it is worthy of exceptional legal treatments. Um, and let me describe a little bit of what, what we mean by that. The, the existing rules um, that we have now uh, are riddled with all kinds of holes um, that make regulating the specific harms of facial recognition technology difficult. And the problem is that a lot of these harms that I described previously don't necessarily rise, at least within US frameworks, to the level of some sort of actionable harm, right? And so the, the, the evisceration of obscurity doesn't happen in one fell chop, but it happens with a thousand sort of little nicks. Um, and what happens is that while we implement practices that are proceduralist in nature, that say you can use facial recognition as long as you do uh, impact assessment, or you can use facial recognition as long as you get people's consent, all these frameworks are going to ultimately end up doing is entrenching these systems when they become normalized and very difficult to, uh, to uproot once we know the full scope of potential harms um, and the, the, we've passed the point of no return in terms of meaningfully uh, mitigating them. And so Evan and I make the, art, the point that we are at a crucial juncture with the regulation of facial recognition technologies because they have not yet fully taken hold within the infrastructure and within the norms of our community. So uh, what do I mean by the existing rules being uh, riddled with holes. So um, the first one uh, is that in, at least in US conversations, there's a tendency to want to solve almost all problems of personal information technologies with an application of the fair information practices. Uh, these are the hallowed principles that are enshrined in the GDPR and California's Consumer Privacy Act and multiple laws actually within the United States that uh, um, seek to provide informational self-determination because that is the goal, right? Of, of many uh, uh, data protection regimes is to give people fundamental control over their own informational destinies. Um, and so to do that, we give people rights of deletion. There are rights of accuracy, right? rights of correction. Um, the, the goal is to empower people by being transparent, giving them the information they need and seeking their permission or their authorization before something happens. Um, and control is a, it sounds like a noble goal, right? Why shouldn't we use control to regulate this particular 
uh, information technology in the same way that we are using it to apply to to mobile apps and other sorts of, of uh, technologies that, that interact with people. The problem uh, that I have come to, to realize is that control is probably the wrong goal for data privacy regimes um, for several reasons. One of which is that the way in which control gets manifested, the way in which we recognize informational self-determination within mediated environments is through this. It's through the button, right? All of you probably recognize this button. You could say, if you want facial recognition technology to be used, you can press it, yes, right? If you don't want it to be used, you can press it, no. And this seems like a simple enough decision. What's the problem? You might be saying at this point, Woody, what, what, what's, your, what's your problem? And, and here's where things, I think, start to go wrong a little, right? Because it's simple enough to look at this one simple button and say, yes, I want facial recognition technology, or no, I don't. But of course, this option never exists in isolation. It exists within a set of menus, right? And so we say, oh, okay. Um, so maybe now I sort of make a few choices and I say, I, I look through all these and somewhere in here, facial recognition technology is embedded, right? So we spend the time, maybe we recognize the facial recognition button, we select it, right? And we say, okay, I have exercise control. I now have informational self-determination. My, uh, my rights have been respected. And then we sit back, we pour a cup of coffee and we say, oh dear, I've got a lot of buttons to press. Right, um, and uh, and this is something that I think uh, is really a problem, not just with facial recognition technologies, but with the entire way in which we conceive of control um, within um, within systems. And I know that, of course, in uh, the European Union, there's data protection by design and by default. Um, which is seen as a way to sort of fight this problem. But if something is so dangerous uh, and, and, and it requires um, such justifications of knowing voluntary revocable consent, I think it's worth actually revisiting whether we want to allow the practice um, in the first place. And then the next problem with the idea of, of using things like consent mechanisms to regulate facial recognition technologies is that the um, the preconditions for meaningful consent are never going to exist for, uh, for any sort of uses, uh, most sort of uses of facial recognition technology. So uh, in work with, with Evan and also in work in, in collaboration with Neil Richards, a law professor at Washington University, um, we've written that in order for consent to be meaningful, voluntary, knowing, revocable, and all the things, there actually has to be a a background within which that consent request is made. Um, and that is one, that the requests are infrequent. Two, that uh, there should be that the harms that you seek to be avoided, right? That, that the harms that their consent regime is built around must be vivid. And three, there should be incentives to take each request seriously. Now, let me unpack a little uh, what I mean by that. So first, such requests should be infrequent. This gets back to this problem right here, right? That every single request for consent, if we're going to regulate it with consent, takes a tax on us, right? It costs something in terms of our attention, in terms of our, our uh, cognitive load, our, our abilities that we're, we're doing. And think about the areas in which consent, um, at least debatably, somewhat works in other areas. Things like, giving cons informed consent to surgery, right? You don't have a lot of surgery in your life, at least hopefully, right? So when it comes and someone says, hey, just so you know, here are all the risks that could happen when you go under general anesthesia and we cut you open, right? And you say, okay, so that's not so frequent. So I've got the time then to actually think about it. Whereas for some reason we have decided to regulate data practices and, and sort of surveillance practices with an onslaught of consent, right? Asking over and over and over as anyone that has logged onto a website and hastily clicked the I agree button for cookies um, can attest to. So the request should be infrequent. Two, the harms to be weighed must be vivid. When you consent to surgery, you are thinking to yourself, okay, here's what could go wrong. 
One, the person could slip, right, and cut too much and maybe cut an artery or something like that. That is a vivid risk that we can imagine. But the risks of facial recognition technology and a lot of data practices in general, in fact, are not so vivid. They are, in fact, quite opaque, not only because they take place remotely, right, away from our body, not close to us, but in some shady server in a different country, perhaps, um, but also because they require us to project far into the future. And there are so many potential risks, right? Um, and so these are, these are, in fact, not vivid risks. They are completely hidden. Even if they are described to us, we have difficulty pulling them up in our mind, right? Um, and then uh, uh, at least a lot of them. And then the, the, the third uh, reason why the preconditions for meaningful consent will never exist for all sorts of, of things, including facial recognition, um, will be that we don't have enough incentives to take each particular request for consent seriously. If you misjudge the risks of uh, surgery, for example, bad things could happen, significantly bad things, one of which is you could die, you could have serious health complications. If you um, uh, misjudge the risks of clicking that I agree button, what's going to happen? What's the worst that could happen? Probably not much, right? Because each individual request for consent is not by itself the kind of thing that rises to the level of a uh, a significant problem, right? Rather, these privacy concerns are the death by a thousand cuts. So the, the sort of collective output of a thousand different uh, consents is different than if we were to face it one at a time, right? Which is the way in which the decision is presented to us discreetly. Um, and so control and consent regimes uh, are not going to work for that reason, but there's actually a deeper reason um, that I think that control and consent regimes are not going to be truly effective uh, in limiting uh, facial recognition technologies. And it gets to this concept um, that was written about by Nancy Kim in a phenomenal book called Consentability. Um, and she describes this concept known as a collective autonomy, not an individual autonomy, but our collective well-beings. And let me um, unpack a little uh, what I mean by that. So even assuming that individuals could meaningfully consent to facial recognition systems, inevitably this is going to end up in a collective people will end up being worse off. And here's what I mean by that. In a democracy, it's reasonable to expect that many people will put a greater weight on the costs and benefits of a particular decision that are relevant to them and people like them. In other words, when we give consent for personal information, we're thinking about what could happen to us or maybe broadly people like us, right? Um, this is just the sort of standard pull of tribalism and privilege, which bias decision-making in the aggregate. So in practice, this means that if citizens are not members of minority and marginalized communities, they might not be sufficiently concerned with how their gain from facial recognition comes at other people's expenses. In other words, when we start saying, I want to board a plane sooner, and we click, yes, I consent to the use of facial recognition technologies, we are not anticipating how that same system could be used against marginalized or vulnerable communities um, uh, or the ways in which those systems are biased against marginalized or vulnerable communities. Naturally, it's just not part of the calculus because we are asked to make these individualized kinds of decisions. And so over time, what happens is the majority groups consent to these offers. They, they, they do their own sort of individualized cost benefit justification that results in large scale social uh, uh, transformation that compromises the autonomy interest of marginalized groups because they don't get the choice anymore. In other words, um, when, when a collective majority votes, I agree, then it allows these systems to move forward with full force without considering the collective autonomy interest of these marginalized groups. And so the end result is that it is, it, it is it's likely a society that is not able to provide an adequate base level of autonomy protections for all their citizens. 
So if marginalized groups come to experience the pervasive chill of having not just their public movements, but also their identities and their mental states monitored, then the rest of society is not justified in making choices that lead to this outcome. The end result would be the unraveling of obscurity and with it, the erosion of democratic legitimacy through the tyranny of the majority, which, we th we, which Evan and I argue is an unjust outcome. Um, and so what do we do with this then? Where can we go? Um, we have argued that the best, best path forward here um, is not through uh, the standard playbook, right? So the standard playbook, as, we, as at least we have experienced it within the US and as, um, as best I can understand it from an EU perspective as well, is that we should apply general surveil anti-surveillance rules here and we should apply general data protection and data privacy rules here. Um, which of course means things like, you know, throwing more FIPS edits. This is in the United States, at least sometimes the response to many kinds of privacy problems is just throw some more FIPS at it, right? You clearly weren't like FIPing hard enough. And uh, has anyone seen Spinal Tap? You're like, you know, just turn it up to 11, right? You're just, you're just doing the same thing and doing what we've always done will result in getting what we've always gotten. And that's not going to be good enough for facial recognition, for limiting the abuses of facial recognition technologies. Um, and so what we argue then is that the best path forward uh, is through having a frank discussion about uh, what these technologies are, what they're capable of, um, and, and what we think uh, should happen with them in the future. So we think that the best path forward is through stigmas, moratoriums, um, and, and bans. And let's sort of explain a little uh, what we mean by that. Um, so the, the first argument that we make here, and I, I mentioned this a little earlier, is that facial recognition is, is unique. So there's, of course, within technology law and policy, there's an ongoing debate about whether any technology is sufficiently unique that we should single it out for regulation. Um, there are, of course, very good arguments not to single out particular technologies, one of, one of which is technologies change so quickly. As soon as you create a regulatory regime for one kind of technology, uh, then by the time that law passes, then that technology is outdated and we've moved on to the next thing. Um, and of course, we think that that's a good general operating rule. But that being said, there are certain circumstances that, uh, that I would argue are actually compelling for us to single out specific technologies. And in fact, the law does this all of the time. Uh, in the United States, we have lots of specific rules for individual technologies. We have specific rules for cars. We have specific rules for planes because they present unique affordances that are, that are worth responding to. We even have specific rules for the internet as a whole, right? This is, many of you may be familiar with the debate over Section 230 in the United States, which immunizes uh, uh, platforms from all sorts of, of uh, liability for their content moderation decisions. And so uh, we think facial recognition is unique, not only as a technology, a surveillance technology generally, um, but as a biometric technology. In other words, we think that facial recognition technology is even sufficiently more dangerous than things like fingerprint readers, than things like uh, reading your, 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 your irises, right? So one of the interesting things that uh, we found when we started researching biometrics is that there are all sorts of unique uh, things about our body. So not only our eyes and our, our faces, but apparently the position of our ears our gait, the way we walk. Apparently our heartbeats are unique. So in other words, we can be identified by our heartbeats, which is slightly terrifying. Um, and so, but even among all of these other biometrics, we make the argument that facial recognition is uniquely dangerous. And here's what we mean by that. There are a couple of different reasons. Um, one of which is that, um, uh, our distinguishing facial features can be captured at a distance and are difficult to hide. In fact, in some countries, it is actually against the law to hide your face in particular ways. 
Um, and so this is something that would, it creates a, a for those that want to engage in obfuscation attempts, for those that want to seek to hide themselves, right? So that, that do want to exert any sort of meaningful self-control um, over their ability to be watched and opt out of the system. Um, for fingerprints, perhaps there are ways that you can, you know, not be tracked uh, with your fingers um, or others, but it is very difficult to hide your face for an extended period of time um, uh, in public, particularly given certain rules in particular, in particular areas. Um, the next reason is that there's actually an existing legacy of name face databases. So if you are going to try to create a surveillance system that monitored people's heartbeats, then you've actually got to spend the amount of time to initially register everyone's heartbeats, right? If you're going to create a surveillance system that tracks everyone's gait, then you've got to create a whole new surveillance system that tracks everyone's gait and matches them to a person. But when it comes to names and faces, the groundwork has already been laid. Facebook has probably the largest name face database in the entire world. Every government has, particularly when they issue government IDs, has a, a, a database that has your photo and that links your name to it. And so it becomes much more easier than to create this. And when the transaction costs of surveillance are low, you can naturally anticipate more surveillance actually occurring. Um, uh, and so this makes exploitation through plug and play mechanisms um, significantly easier. Um, on top of that, uh, it's worth noting that uh, the, the means of deploying, of monitoring people in real time have also been widely deployed for facial recognition technologies in a way that are, is not true for other biometrics. CCTVs exist everywhere. But even more than CCTVs, the way in which we can capture people's faces is ubiquitous. How do we do it? Everyone knows, right? We all have one of these. And we can all use them at a moment's notice, right? In a way that is different from other sorts of biometric surveillance tools. Um, and so, so facial recognition is completely plug and play in a way that other, other tools are not. Um, and then that leads to another reason why I think that facial recognition is, uh, is completely uh, unique and worthy of singular regulation. And that's that there's this tipping point creep um, that uh, there's, there's always a desire to sort of add on facial recognition to any other particular layer because so much video of our faces is already being, uh, is being used. And we've seen this sort of expressed um, uh, an example that was used in the United States is for a long time, people's license plate readers have been used to track uh, tolls, right? You, you implement an RFID system or you, you use a license plate reader and that's the way in which you pay tolls uh, on many toll roads in the United States, including here in Boston, the, the Massachusetts Turnpike. And one of the proposals that was put forth in New York City is, well, why not use facial recognition technology for this? This would be a much more accurate way. Um, it, it, it allows us to, to, to find, uh, to more directly collect money from the person who is operating the car rather than uh, the, the actual car owners themselves. We don't have to go through, you know, rental agencies and things like that. And so there's always that one additional potential use that's going to over time push a creep of this technology deeper and deeper into our lives. And then finally, and this is, this is what I think is, is um, uh, one of the most immutable points about the differences within facial recognition, um, uh, as, even as opposed to other biometric technologies, because of course there's a lot of arguments about biometrics being different than passwords because you can't replace your fingerprints once it's been compromised in a way that you can easily replace your, your password. And so like that, you, can, you can't change your face. Um, many people may have rec seen the movie Minority Reports where the uh, uh, individual on the run had to get an eye tracking to avoid the eye tracking technologies, which is particularly gruesome. Um, but uh, it bears noting that the final reason is that unlike irises, unlike your fingerprints, unlike your gait or your heartbeats, your face is uniquely central to your identity, who you are. When many of you recall this talk, and I hope that I've been at least somewhat memorable enough that you might think about it 
uh, at some point later, you probably won't recall what my hands look like or what my elbow looks like or what my fingerprint looks like, but you will recall my face. Um, and so we are now creating a system of surveillance that is built around one of the most innate um, intimate features of our identity. Um, and so I think that given the fact that that's unlikely to change, it makes it a little safer to single out facial recognition technology from a regulatory perspective, even as opposed to other sorts of technologies. Another reason um, that facial recognition uh, technology uh, is, we argue, should be uh, outright banned or, or have a moratorium is that it's irresistible. At base, facial recognition technologies are tools of control. And that means that, that organizations and individuals that want the ability to control other people will find it irresistible. We are seeing that occur already. And when I say control, sometimes it's innocuous control, right? But sometimes it is not. Sometimes it's oppressive control. Um, and that's not going to change. If anything, the more accurate facial recognition technology becomes, the greater the appetite that governments, corporations, and people looking to harass others um, will have for this particular technology. And so, uh, in other words, um, the facial recognition is scary when it's biased, but it's even worse the more accurate it becomes. Uh, and then finally, and this is the, the sort of cost benefit point that we wanna make is that facial recognition benefits come at far too great a cost. So Evan and I have articulated the benefits of facial recognition in at least two different ways. One of which we say is a modest benefit. So a modest benefit would, being a, would be able to board uh, an airplane without having to pull out your boarding pass, right? You just scan your face and you walk on. That is a modest benefit. It was not really that difficult to pull out the boarding pass or hold on to it. We've been, we've been making do pretty well. And it's probably not worth implementing an entire surveillance structure just for that modest benefit. Um, this also goes towards unlocking your phone with your face as opposed to your thumb. Um, at least from my own anecdotal experience, there wasn't that much wrong with unlocking um, your phone with your thumb in the first place. Um, so this is, this is a marginal benefit for normalizing uh, what we think is ultimately destructive behavior. Um, but even beyond that, there are some significant benefits that we might be able to realize. Of course, finding missing persons, catching bad guys, right? These are compelling reasons why we want facial recognition. But here's the problem. In order to fully realize those benefits, we will have to sacrifice everything in terms of privacy in terms of obscurity, because we will need those databases to talk to each other, right? In order to meaningfully catch someone. We will need um, cameras to be everywhere, right? To be always watching people um, if we want to recognize those benefits. Um, and we think that there's, there is a, a, a probably less destructive, less harmful ways of almost nearly achieving something similar, because a lot of times uh, the fact that, that we, we don't, um, uh, uh, efficacy questions when it comes to uh, locating people or law enforcement purposes sometimes deal with questions of impetus rather than ability, um, or whether we are willing to accept costs of less intrusive means. Um, and so what's the way forward then? Uh, the first is we need to talk about these technologies, uh, 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 I think more frankly, and recognize the real dangers. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, facial recognition is a neutral tool. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad, but I don't think that's true. There are no such thing as neutral technologies. In my book, Privacy's Blueprint, I make the argument that every single design decision for a technology um, is meant to change the world in some different, in some kind of way, right? That, that's what a technology does. It is an artifact that acts upon the world. Um, and so as such, it by definition cannot be neutral. It makes certain realities more or less likely. And we know that facial recognition is a tool of control and we know what the, the, the likely uses of it will be. Um, we've already seen that in practice. So we need to talk about it, I think with the right framing. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to make sure um, that we don't just delay the inevitability, right? By implementing procedural rules um, one of the reasons we argue for a moratoria is simply because we need, we need time to think about how we want to regulate this technology before it becomes implemented. Because once it becomes implemented, 
um, uh, structures become built, a path dependency is created and norms start to be getting formed. Um, and so we, we think that the time to act is now and that the time to act is with an outright ban. Um, given the inevitable abuses of this technology, even when it's, it's regulated with the current playbook, we think that the only way to meaningfully protect ourselves against the inevitable abuses of facial recognition is with an outright ban. Um, we understand that, of course, that a ban is controversial, uh, uh, although it's less, it's potentially less of a uh, pipe dream than it used to be. Uh, when Evan and I first proposed this a couple of years ago, we were met with sort of widespread uh, uh, laughter and sort of like, ah, that's never going to happen. And then cities in the United States started banning facial recognition technologies, at least for law enforcement. San Francisco, Oakland, Somerville, a couple of places here in Massachusetts, and, it, and it's gone on. And so perhaps it's not as wild uh, of an idea as it first initially seems, mainly because humans create technologies and humans can regulate them, right? That, that, that ultimately, uh, we don't buy into the, to the myth of technological determinism. We think that humans control our own destinies with these rules. Um, and even short of a ban, we would argue for the idea that we need rules around the destruction of nameface databases because the databases power these AI tools um, in really important ways. Uh, we need rules around the design of these systems. We need rules around who can purchase and use these systems. And most importantly, and this is perhaps more pervasive in the US than in the EU, we need to dispel the notion that any information that exists in public is fair game for anyone to scrape or to use or to monitor, um, because we think that that is simply uh, not true. And I'm happy to talk about that uh, more in the Q&A. So, um, thank you very much for your time, uh, and I look forward to your questions. I appreciate you having me here. Uh, thank you very much, Woodrow. Uh, a very, very provocative speech. I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions and even uh, comments on what you just said. Um, now the floor is open for, for questions and, and comments. Um, we already have a question uh, that has been sent to the chat box. Uh, let me just pull out, uh, let me just read it. And I think this is for, it's uh, somehow related to what Beatrice said. So let me just read Leonardo's question, which says, how can an autonomous vehicle consider accountable for any accident concerning other road non-autonomous users? It's a matter of responsibility, so I'll give the floor to you, if you don't mind, Beatrice. Yes, of course. Um, well, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, we have a different level of autonomy. So there are like five uh, uh, levels of autonomy. And I think that the responsibility model that we can apply to these cases will depend on this level of autonomy and on the position of the drivers and on the requirement of the so-called meaningful human control. And here we could open a huge parenthesis uh, uh, as uh, also Professor Herzog said before on the, uh, on the possibility that control is the answer. And here, I don't know if I can do that, but maybe here's a question also for Professor Herzog. I, I will uh, catch this opportunity because I think that uh, the, the case of idealizing control uh, can be also relevant in uh, uh, building uh, responsibility models uh, in concerning criminal law and uh, artificial intelligence systems. But here's, uh, I think it's an interesting question. And okay, close parenthesis, so, um, coming back to <laughs> autonomous vehicles. Uh, for now, we have only a few, stated, a few states that have uh, prepared or already adopted the general uh, legislation on uh, criminal liability for accidents involving drivers, drivers oh my god, car, uh, self-driving cars. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, France and Italy have authorized uh, uh, the testing of autonomous uh, uh, cars. And uh, here the responsibility depends on uh, the compliance with the conditions that legitimate the use of the uh, autonomous operating mode and on the takeover request issued by the system in case of dangerous situations. 
So I believe there, there are like no uh, specific provisions uh, concerning the case of accidents that involve autonomous and non-autonomous vehicles, but the intention is to elaborate a legal framework that provides uh, for a set of legal obligations for the drivers, but also and especially for the designers and producers that can apply to all cases. Of course, the different legal obligations could then be elaborated, distinguishing the level of autonomy of the vehicle. For now, I would say that uh, this is a, a political uh, um, choice, uh, so it will concern uh, crim the, the, the choice on criminal policy. And I, I, I hope uh, I answered the, the question. Yes, I think that one of the takeaways is that uh, is that the, um, there are various um, potential solutions for this problem. It really depends on the uh, constitutional framework with, uh, of each legal system. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see if, the, if we see any uh, hands waved. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if anybody has questions. I have questions, but maybe somebody would like to. Uh, yeah, oh, one of the speakers has, has a comment to make, probably. Please, Woodrow, the floor is yours. Well, I just, I just wanted to actually add on to the existing uh, uh, quest, uh, question that was asked, which I, I, Please. I completely agree. Um, uh, and just, I just wanted to add that, that there's a, some research that I've done with ro some roboticists at Oregon State University. Uh, and we try to tackle this exact question because of course it's very, it's, it's a very difficult problem. Um, and one of the things that we have, have explored is the idea of what we call an education theory of faults for designers of autonomous systems. And the idea would be um, that the responsibility is to, it, because there are multiple people that are involved in building AI systems, is that there actually is a affirmative obligation on all uh, participants within that system to educate each other. And if you fail to educate each other, then that in and of itself could be blameworthy. And, and the example that we give is a procurer goes to the roboticist, and I love working with roboticists because they can help me understand exactly how the, the system works. And, and they say something like, um, I want a car that can uh, drive without, uh, uh, you know, in an automated way without a driver, it can drive itself. And then they have to be much more specific in what they mean, because otherwise they, that's too sort of indeterminate. They, they use the language of entropy, uh, uh, my colleagues. And then the designer has to say, okay, here's what the car can do. But if you take it off road, it's going to, you know, if you get it too close to a car, here are the different ways it can mess up. And so it, it involves testing and it involves educating each other. So that was just a, uh, an additional way of thinking about it that uh, is in a forthcoming publication. Um, as a Taurus professor, that's just something I think about. Thank you so much for, for, for adding uh, on, the, on the question. Uh, let's Chana, see, we have- we Chana have, Chiara, there is Ana Chiara. Uh, that, uh, so you can unmute and ask the question. Yes, uh, just hold on. Uh, can you just unmute it? Mute okay. You should be able to do that. Yes, I can. Nakiara, please, uh, you have a question. Um, I had a question for Professor Hartsoak. Hope to pronounce it well. Um, uh, um, your, your presentation reminded me a lot about uh, an episode of Black Mirror. I don't know if anyone saw it on Netflix where people have things on their eyes that can um, scan of people and remember names, faces, and also rates uh, like um, <clears throat> Instagram likes. And so uh, it's a kind of 90, 1984 scenario that's quite scary for me. And uh, what, I, what I was thinking, it's not a proper question, it's more like um, a thought is that I think that a lot of people uh, don't realize the risks of uh, um, uh, these kind of facial recog recognition, artificial intelligence. So um, maybe, I don't know, but I feel like uh, it's not so far away from us. I don't know if I can explain myself, but um, even though legislators can control it or limit it, I feel like not, tomorrow or in one or two years, but one day that will be what people will, will use to uh, 
do all the things you mentioned, such as catching bad, bad, bad guys and finding missing persons, but also for all the other purposes, like uh, the most um, social uh, part of that um, systems. So uh, do you think that to prevent that from uh, spreading, it is necessary to build a, a kind of social conscience about these uh, dangerous systems? That's, I, I completely agree. A, I've seen that episode of Black Mirror and it's terrifying. I mean, all episodes of Black Mirror are terrifying. I think that's the point of the show, but, um, but that one is particularly terrifying. And I do think that a lot of the problem so when Evan and I talk about this, we talk about the, the, we say there's always a sort of justification for any sort of invasive technology. And it becomes hard to counter it because we don't have a set line of privacy that is sort of like, you know, a society, it, it, privacy is a little bit like other goods that are hard to quantify. Like how much laughter do we need in a society? Right. I mean, we know we want it. We know we want joy, but it's hard to say we need exactly 80 percent joy in our society. Right. Anything more, it's excessive. Um, and so it, there, it's always easy for the no seeking to encroach upon privacy to say, well, uh, you know, this is it, this is OK. This we can use this to to um, to use to catch bad guys. But we obviously wouldn't you say a thought reading machine, right? So let, let's pretend that, that someone creates a machine that can read your thoughts. I hope that most people would, would hear that and say, I'd never want anyone to read my thoughts. Um, but again, a, a thought reading machine would be phenomenal at catching bad guys. It would be amazing. Um, and so I think that we need to, to I, I think a social conscience is probably the best way to think about it is have a better social conversation about the fact that there is a path that we are on in the big picture. Um, and unless we have a meaningful conversation about ways to stop this creep from happening, then we are headed towards um, some version of Black Mirror. I hope it's not quite as bad as Black Mirror, but, but that's the direction that it points. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Woodrow. Um, I didn't see any, uh, I, any I, question. I have a Please. question, if I can. So, Please, I, go ahead, I Samir. want to try to... <laughs> um, okay, I, I have a question to, to, to Chiara uh, Calese, but I think that the, the general then, the, the type of comment question that I have, maybe it's, uh, it's, it can be also then... Uh, uh, open a little bit of uh, of debate about um, the, the less obscure role of inter artificial intelligence. So I was, uh, uh, of course, uh, struck by the, the example that uh, uh, she, you made about this um, using of this uh, system to, to control uh, uh, Technical uh, to control the, the application of, of, of the citizenship, and then because typically this technology is very rigid, of course, then uh, because of maybe a small mis mis mistake, uh, the, the, there was this uh, price to pay that was much higher than the actual uh, problem that uh, the citizen can, uh, and in particular, for, of course, for the most more uh, vulnerable. Uh, classes and, and and i think this is a uh, something that uh, it, it's quite uh, uh, important they said that in design in the design of this technology uh, there is little room for uh, elasticity let's say so for uh, um, they are really rigid and so in this sense they are very dangerous in the use of uh, as a control system but i would like to see the other side so uh, maybe we can use this type of technology to help not as a control, but to help for the application, for example, of uh, or to the uh, application of, of uh, uh, I mean, in many examples, like taxation uh, documents or uh, uh, request or, uh, I mean, in, in many, I, I can think of many typical application where, uh, at least in Italy, probably not in Netherlands, there are a lot of bureaucracy to do, while maybe pre uh, uh, registering and using much of this, uh, uh, implementing these rules and this information in uh, in some kind of algorithms 
this can help the people to prevent uh, in doing mistakes. So this is my uh, my comment question. How can, uh, or if there are any example of these technologies that can be used not to control, but to promote, let's say, so in, in, uh, the, 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 and help the, citizen, the citizenship and also, for example, also help the more vulnerable classes to maybe uh, uh, um, tackle problems that uh, a priori are very complex, but maybe using this kind of technology can be simplified. Thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Okay. So yes, I see your point, but uh, the problem here is that uh, every technology can be used uh, to help, at least uh, with a good intention initially. The problem is that if the model is not transparent, if you don't know how uh, the reasoning of the AI will be performed, and uh, if you cannot explain the final outcome, then there is always the risk of discrimination. Because maybe you are thinking that you are helping people, the vulnerable groups, but there could be so many cases in which still the discrimination is present because the, the, the bias could be also in the sample used to train the A model. So it's not uh, only how you use the technology because it's true that in the Dutch case, maybe uh, they could have used the system in a different way to uh, have a different outcome. But it is also how the model is built in the first place. And also another problem is that uh, vulnerable groups, by definition, they don't have the mean to compete, let's say, with, um, with their counterparty, with the state, with the other powerful party. So they will always be in a position of uh, being um, vulnerable to be less powerful. Their contractual power will be always uh, less uh, than the other party, especially the public administration. And, there, and I also agree um, with the remarks about uh, uh, awareness, social awareness. It is true that, uh, uh, this is, that there is a lack of social awareness, but is it possible to make really, uh, as, as long as uh, vulnerable groups are concerned, make them really understand the consequences of this, of the use of this system, of system that takes a decision over them, a decision that have an actual impact on their rights. Because maybe um, people that are more rich and more educated, they already know how to do the tax application. So, you know, yeah, you can uh, help the vulnerable group, but they still will have, uh, a, there will still be a disparity for them, they will not have the mean to understand how the system work in the first place. Thanks, so it's also a matter of kind of technology because not all uh, artificial intelligence works in, as a black box. So we can think about uh, machine learning algorithm where we have a more transparent and explainable codes. Uh, so probably this is something that, uh, it's a line of thought, I don't know, this is also maybe yeah, uh, in dialogue with the, what uh, Woodrow uh, told. So maybe, I mean, uh, instead of an horizontal ban of AI, maybe we should think about uh, what kind of type of algorithm or, or machine learning algorithm are suitable and also in respect to what kind of application. Uh, so, I mean, of course, if we are speaking about tax, I mean, tax, uh, uh, the regulation is, is different uh, if we are speaking about uh, childhood adoption, for example, I don't know. So depending on the type, on the, on the, on the, on the level of, of the impact of the application on human, one can think uh, and uh, uh, which kind of technology uh, can be used for that specific application. Yes, uh, of course, uh, it depends on how you use the technology, that's for sure. But still, I can see very much uh, inalienable uh, problems uh, regarding uh, the most uh, vulnerable people. I don't know what the other panelists think about this. Just, just but just about because this is uh, stimulating because 
for example, Benjo, uh, that is one of the father of, uh, of neural networks. And uh, actually, I mean, what I want to say that, uh, uh, but Lambert is also here, that I think he can. So many of the father of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, as we know today, they were think they were they were thought of, about it as a possibility for the most vulnerable person. For example, people that cannot go to the hospital or doctor cannot have, cannot have a diagnosis. So actually, you can think that these people, for these people, with this technology, they are accessible to having some 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 uh, diagnosis, some medical diagnosis that otherwise couldn't uh, be possible. For example, so. There is this nice TED Talks of Banjo, that is uh, this famous uh, computer scientist, uh, arguing that uh, actually uh, uh, there are many aspects uh, that uh, can actually uh, allow for the most vulnerable people to have uh, access of services that otherwise couldn't have. No? So uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, but one uh, one point is allowing a service for them and another point is taking a decision that has a legal impact on them so it, there is a difference and also uh, we should really agree on what we do we um, mean by artificial intelligence because the idea that uh, the father of the artificial intelligence had at the beginning is way different from the actual technology that we have now so I, I'm not sure that uh, we are talking about the same thing as them, because now we only have, let's say, expert systems. It's not really a, a strong eye. So also, we, we really needed to, to understand that, um, that um, right now the technology is not so developed to, um, to be so uh, safe, let's say, because it's still built by a human and uh, this human could uh, uh, make a lot of mistakes. I'm not talking about bugs that of course are not preventable, but uh, more than a bias and discrimination on the starting. For example, in the medical di diagnosis that you were mentioning, uh, you know that now uh, in scientific research, there is um, a debate about uh, the fact that uh, medicines uh, are only uh, tested on male rats that uh, only uh, the, uh, the um, amount of drug that uh, are prescribed by uh, doctors are based on only young, healthy, uh, white males. So we are, yeah, uh, th there are many things to, to consider. Uh, it's not some, that simple. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me just grab a mic because I have two people queued. Uh, the first one is uh, Elisa Spiller. Uh, I, I think she has a question. I'll give the floor to you, Elisa, please. Okay. We can't hear you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, um, thank you. And uh, I have this question that is linked to the one just uh, introduced by Samir. I'm a lawyer and uh, in, at this moment, I don't wanna be the lawyer of Havil, but I have this question that is in the middle between the legal concerns and uh, technologist uh, optimism. Uh, what is your position, what is your opinion about a possible nuance approach to the use of technology? I mean, both uh, Chiara and uh, Professor Erzgo uh, uh, have a very strong approach, uh, define a very uh, well-defined positions in their presentation. And uh, I understand the legal concern uh, at the basis of this uh, limitation very strong limitation. But on the other hand, looking at the possibility that technologies provide uh, in general, I wonder if maybe not now, not immediately, but in future with uh, the due safeguards, if you see any possibility for a nuanced approach and which should be the perimeter of this uh, mandatory and strong limitation that ban 
a kind of technology from the use the usual user by people. Thank you. As I think that this is related before we give the floor, I think this question was for Professor Herzog, Elisa, right? Um, uh, I think that Professor Berlan also has something uh, uh, related to this topic, if I'm not mistaken. I, I know Professor Berlan is, a, is especially the bad guy within the, this, this virtual room, and I, he, I think he's looking for a backup job after what you said, Woodrow, as he's working on, on artificial recognition. So do you, would you like to add anything on this, uh, Lamberto, um, or do you have another and a question on a different subject because i yeah, just thought i, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know if it's related to Lisa, Lisa's one so maybe it is uh, better to okay uh, sure to sure okay that. woodrow floor is yours sure so that's a great question and uh i have thought a lot about nuanced approaches i actually think that banning facial recognition is a nuanced approach within the larger approach to artificial intelligence generally Right, that the idea is that we single out the, the key operating presumption that I want that that I would adopt as from a regulatory stance is that technologies we should not allow all technologies just because we never know what's going to happen. Right, that we can actually foresee all sorts of harms, and so we can create lots of different ways in which. Um, we can we can limit those harms and it's okay if we want to limit this and allow that right because we're people and we create technologies and and in fact I think there's a good argument that innovation will flourish if we say you can't use facial recognition technology then we redeploy resources into other sorts of AI powered technologies and again I don't want to come off as as anti artificial intelligence I think there's incredible promise generally speaking um, and but even within facial recognition technologies, there is a potentially less dramatic approach than banning the whole thing off the face of the planet. Um, you might consider not allowing uses uh, of facial recognition technology in public, right? That, could, that would solve some issues. You might not allow it for significant, um, and this gets to what Kiara was talking about, you, you might not allow it uh, for significant decision-making reasons, right? So you can't use facial recognition technology with any automated decision-making system. Or maybe you say you can't use it um, uh, for, uh, you can't collect databases, large databases, right? So maybe the problem is not the use of facial recognition one-on-one, -on -one, but rather the specter of, of one to many, right? That one person can spy on everyone all the time, right? So, so maybe we say, well, you just can't create large nameface databases, right? And we, we target the databases and you could chop that up lots of different ways um, and, and so, at least with respect to facial recognition, I think that that's a, a potential more nuanced approach. And then to zoom back a little more, one of the things that I've argued for, um, for the regulation of, of artificial intelligence and data generally, because I think that it's becoming increasingly difficult to separate out the law of AI and the law of privacy and data protection and because those, those things are merged together in some really interesting ways. Um, I argue for what I call the Swiss cheese approach. Have, have you ever, at this point in the pandemic, we've heard about the, if you layer Swiss cheese up enough, then there's no holes in them at all, right? This is, this is what I think. So we, let's have um, fiduciary obligations on top of data protection obligations, like the Data Governance Act that the European Commission just introduced has this concept in it. And so, um, in addition to sort of slicing up, I think, substantive rules, we also should have that layered approach. And, and that to me is in fact a little more nuanced than a, you know, one rule that says never again, you know, facial recognition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Woodrow. Uh, Lamberto, what is yours? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a couple of comments. So, uh, I mean, let's start with the last thing that uh, uh, Professor Azok was saying that uh, uh, I think that, yeah, I definitely agree with the, with this. Uh, because, I mean, in general, going back to what was said previously, uh, and also to connect to uh, Samir Sve's previous uh, comment, uh, I mean, I, I work in uh, computer vision and uh, machine learning. So, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm, 
I, uh, my time is mostly uh, spent uh, in uh, working in this, uh, on these models from a scientific point of view, but that, that's my, so I'm optimistic, not, I mean, if, if uh, so I, 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 inevitably I'm partially optimistic on it. Uh, and so most of the, as uh, Samir was saying previously, uh, I mean, there are multiple examples that almost all the examples that you, even in face recognition, I think there are, uh, I mean, you can see the benefit of this, of this, of, of this stuff. So uh, from that point of view, I, I, I'm completely, uh, uh, I disagree on the, on the full ban of, of any technology. And from that point of view, I really think that uh, I agree on the partially on the idea that at the end, uh, it's, the, uh, it's not the technology as it was previously mentioned in one of the slides. Uh, so I, okay, I see in that, uh, uh, that basically saying that uh, it's not the technology per se that is devil, uh, I mean, the devil, but it's uh, how, do you, how you use it. And so, and I think that uh, this at the end, especially in this time where we have uh, uh, more complexity, these uh, demand uh, more awareness on at every stage. This come, uh, this starts from who work on these things, uh, but even on the final user. So this, I think, is a so this uh, so responsibility is not just to me. It's not just a problem for who designed these models, who decide how to use it, and uh, what can you do with it, but even with the final user, right? So I think this is one of the main, uh, uh, to me, one of the most fascinating, and interesting thing of, of this uh, this time, and. Therefore, uh, for example, going back to the bias part, uh, on that case, uh, I strongly disagree with most of the things that were said previously. Because, and I try to do the, um, I try to say this uh, with an example. Uh, let's use the face recognition example. So, the, uh, I mean, if you look at the, uh, I think one of the most important, talking about bias and the effect of, uh, face recognition in this case on minorities. And uh, I mean, uh, so th that work is an example where it has been shown that uh, face recognition system uh, are going to prove to give you no, not 97, 98% of accuracy as you would expect. Uh, but maybe this is true if you are a white Caucasian man, if you are a dark skin uh, women, uh, this accuracy is around uh, 75%, right? So, but th this is a problem uh, that not of a, of a bias that is introduced by an algorithm. This is more an example of an amplified bias because similar things happen also for humans. So I, I, I lived in the US for a couple of years. So this is something that is happening also uh, on the police officer. So police officer has a completely different degree of uh, uh, accuracy in recognizing uh, white men, I mean, a white, uh, <laughs> Uh, a Caucasian white man, uh, and I have a personal experience on it. I mean, uh, when I moved to US, uh, I was not as able as uh, after a, a couple of years uh, to recognize uh, Asian people because I was not used to it. There are multiple study in uh, cognitive neuroscience demonstrating this. That I mean, since you haven't observed uh, enough examples of that particular category, then you are not able to recognize. You don't have the same accuracy. So this is to say that then I, I I'm. I mean, I, I agree that uh, it's important to regulate uh, multiple things. Uh, for example, in this particular context, uh, the data collection is an important, uh, that procedure is important. In the medical domain, so uh, in that sense, I strongly disagree on the idea that uh, maybe this, uh, I mean, we have a lot of things that already are uh, in multiple area. Going back to the healthcare case. I mean, there are some of my former colleagues at Stanford that presented the work where, uh, I mean, you can get uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, accuracy in recognizing melanoma uh, images that is, uh, in some cases, uh, that is stronger than the one that you can get from uh, a medical doctor from, uh, I mean, from the whole Packard uh, uh, I mean, hospital in, uh, US, in uh, Stanford is one of the best hospital in the US, right? So this is to say that there are, uh, so most of the motivation underlying those systems are to improve. But obviously, I mean, this is, uh, as any technology, this can be used in, a, in the right direction or in the wrong direction. So from, from, from that point of view, I, I strongly disagree on the ban. But going back to our case, I agree that fascia, 
on, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm with him uh, on the idea that facial recognition for all the motivation that uh, uh, he reported, that facial recognition is a particular case that should be regulated uh, in a particular way. So it's not uh, uh, one uh, simple example of visual recognition. It's, very, uh, it's a very particular case. Yeah, so this is why my first comment on most of the things. So I'm not the bad guy. <laughs> this is the, this is the. Uh, uh, Woodrow, feel free to, to strike back. Sure, absolutely. Well, I certainly didn't mean to imply that, that anyone that works on facial recognition is a bad guy. Um, in fact, that, that uh, I gave this presentation one time uh, and a computer science friend of mine was like, I feel like you're attacking me. And I was like, I'm not attacking you. I, there are all sorts of technologies, you're right, that, that have both beneficial uses and uh, negative uses. And there's no denying that there are, in fact, potential uses for uh, good uses for facial recognition. Um, but I guess my larger point is when it comes to the regulatory model, um, I, I just, I guess, disagree with the idea that we should allow all technologies and just regulate their uses. Um, a blowtorch would be really great to clear a forest, but we don't want to go giving, you know, blowtorches or, or clearing uh, certain things. We don't want to give blowtorches. You could use landmines to sort of police your grounds, but we don't, you know, give those out as well because they are just too dangerous. And so a lot of it has to do with just how dangerous you perceive it is, right? Um, and once we've agreed on the fact that if a, if a technology is sufficiently dangerous, um, then even the potential benefits that we get aren't worth it given the inevitable abuses. That's just the argument that Evan and I are making is that the sort of risk benefit calculus um, just doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, there's no sort of way in which we envision people coming out ahead. That's debatable, right? We, know, we understand that it's debatable. We understand that, that lots of people see the, the benefits differently than we do. In terms of bias, I mean, you make a great point, right? And I didn't mean to imply that bias doesn't exist in the, in the human world. It's actually because bias exists in the human world as to why it, uh, facial recognition is biased, because of course it's humans all the way down. The thing that we worry about, which you identify is the systemization of it, right? So it's one thing for one individual person to be biased, but as, as one individual person becomes biased and it, the risk becomes dispersed, on an individualized level, it's when it becomes systematized that the importance of that bias, which I think you're exactly right, becomes um, significantly more important. And then the other thing that we, we wanted to avoid is the concept of automation bias, where there's been noted examples of people trusting decisions that are made by computers simply because they're made by computers rather than people, um, because we have a tendency to trust that that's somehow more correct and we don't see the biases which are baked in. Right. Um, and, and so that's sort of, I, I, we recognize that there's a lot of room for debate um, on this point. But it, the, the, for us, the point that we just wanted to make is that the risk calculus in our eyes for facial recognition just does not come out um, on the plus side when everything is weighed, even with, even with, with potential use restrictions. Now, and that's not to say fa facial uh, uh, detection technologies, right? So one of the things that we also wanted to, and this goes to uh, Elisa's uh, point about a more nuanced approach. If you want automated cars to work or any sort of robotics in society, you're going to have to recognize faces, right? Because that's the easiest way for us to tell the difference between things that are alive and things that are not. Um, so uh, we do think that there is, there is some room for some nuance uh, at, even within the, we call it a ban. It really is just prohibitions on different sorts of uses or procurement. Um, and so that's just a shorthand way of talking about it in, in terms of regulations. But we do recognize there's room for disagreement here. And, and I think uh, we, with disagreement, we end. <laughs> uh, we had a really drawing to a clause. Uh, let me thank everyone uh, who participated in the in, in the in the program today? Uh, thanks to Chiara Gallese, thanks to Beatrice Panattoni, and thanks to Vudru Herzog, and to all of our attendees and those who who asked questions. Um, the we had we we know we have some questions left, but we are really running out of time, and uh, we need to um, uh, to say goodbye to everyone. And uh, we hope to stay in touch. The, we will keep doing this stuff. Uh, and we'll be doing this stuff tomorrow as well. Uh, tomorrow we will have um, 
uh, um, Professor Hiedra Juan talking of, of experiments in machine behavior, uh, same time, uh, always through the, the program's website. Uh, thanks again to, to all of you, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing your publications in print since this is research. Thanks so much, and thanks so much, and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.